Hello, in this slide we'll be going over the thyroid and parathyroid gland and while we do that we will uh, go through the hormone systems related to calcium homeostasis as well as the synthesis of thyroid hormone. Whenever I ask a question I suggest that you pause and attempt to answer it yourself. That gives you an indication of how much you know and don't know. So over here in the dark purple we have what's called the thymus we're not going to discuss the thymus in this unit. We're going to pay attention to these light pink circles and this dark mass of cells. The light pink circles make up the, or I should ask, these light pink circles, which gland would they make up? The thyroid gland or the parathyroid gland? These light pink circles are the follicles of the thyroid gland. In contrast, this dense, darkly stained mass is the cells of the parathyroid gland. Now that we've established at the lowest magnification what is the thyroid gland and what is the parathyroid gland, let's zoom in on a follicle and observe the details of that follicle. Here we are looking at the detailed arrangement of the follicles. You can see a number of follicles here in the light pink, the connective tissue between those follicles. I have zoomed in to the highest magnification of one follicle. This whole structure is a follicle and it is composed of the colloid, that solid pink, watery, oily, proteinous mix on the inside of the follicle and then the follicular cells on the outside. So let's talk about the jobs of the follicular cells. The first thing the follicular cells will do is they make, well they express the gene for thyroglobulin protein. They make the mRNA, the thyroglobulin protein, and once the protein is made, that protein is enters the colloid via exocytosis. I'm going to shorten thyroglobulin to Tg. Another thing these cells do over here in this area is where the bloodstream is. These cells are going to actively transport iodide ions made from the element iodine we get from our diet, which is why it was in our bloodstream. They're going to actively transport the iodine into the colloid. Once this occurs, iodine and thyroglobulin combine to form thyroglobulin attached to T3 and T4. What that tells you is when they're called T3 and T4, which are the types of thyroid hormones, T3 is composed of three iodines and T4 is composed of four iodines. T3 and T4 can be stored in the colloid for multiple months. T3 and T4 are released the same amount over long periods of time. So what do you call that kind of release? Constant release over long periods of time. We call that kind of release constitutive release. T3 and T4 are released constitutively, a certain amount, stably, over long periods of time. We can also have increases and decreases in T3, T4 release, depending on a person's body temperature. Which stimulus will increase T4, T3 release? Will that be hypothermia or hyperthermia? Which will be the stimulus for thyroid hormone release? That answer, the stimulus is hypothermia 
or cold, which you remember because thermia is temperature and hypo means less than the ideal temperature. This also brings us to the final job of the follicular cells. The follicular cells contain a receptor which will be responsive to the hormone that precedes thyroid hormone release. So the hormone that causes thyroid hormone release, which is T3 and T4, the hormone that causes thyroid hormone release, there's a receptor for that hormone on the follicular cells. Which hormone causes T3, T4 release? The hormone that will cause T3, T4 release is TSH, which means that this receptor is called what? TSH receptor. So on the follicular cells is TSH receptor, which binds to TSH. And what causes TSH to be released is TRH. And what causes increased TRH to be released is hypothermia. So, when there's the stimulus of hypothermia, increased TRH is released, increased TSH is released, and then what we have is T3 and T4 bound to thyroglobulin, enters the follicular cells, the follicular cells separate T3 from T4, I'm sorry, T3 and T4 from thyroglobulin, so it frees the T3 and T4 from thyroglobulin. And since thyroglob uh, T3 and T4 are lipid soluble, they can enter the bloodstream. To go through all those steps again, the stimulus of hypothermia causes TRH release, increased TRH release, which causes increased TSH release, which causes thyroglobulin bound to T3 and T4 to enter the follicular cells. The follicular cells will separate the T3 and T4 from the thyroglobulin, and since T3 and T4 are lipid soluble, they can freely move into the bloodstream, where they will bind to carrier proteins and be transported to all the cells of the body. Now we are back to the whole slide, and I'm going to zoom in, not to the parathyroid gland, but to the parafollicular cells. If I say parafollicular, where will these cells be located? If I say parafollicular, that means next to, para means next to, the follicle. So we're going to zoom in to the area near the follicle to find the parafollicular cells. Here is a follicle, and here is a follicle. Within the connective tissue surrounding the follicles are the parafollicular cells that release a hormone called calcitonin. Calcitonin is released due to blood calcium levels. So from there, you should be able to answer this question. Is calcitonin release humorally stimulated, hormonally stimulated, or neurally stimulated? Because the sensor is for blood calcium levels, that tells you it is humorally released. In contrast, in the follicle, because TSH causes TH release, TH release is stimulated hormonally. So back to the pa uh, parafollicular cells that release calcitonin. Try from your memory to remember the calcitonin pathway. What is the stimulus for calcitonin release? And what are the effects? The stimulus for calcitonin release is high blood calcium and the effect will be calcitonin release. So next question is what's the goal going to be? 
is the goal going to be to increase or decrease calcium levels? The goal is going to be to decrease blood calcium levels. So they go back to homeostasis. So the effectors for calcitonin are bone, the GI tract, that's the small intestine, or the digestive system, and finally the kidney. As discussed in class, calcium can either be in your blood or out of your blood. So it can either be in your feces or in your blood. Calcium can either be in your urine or in your blood. Calcium can either be in your bone or in your blood. So if your goal is to decrease blood calcium levels, are you going to increase or decrease bone formation? Why don't you try to answer that question? Increase or decrease bone formation? If your goal is to decrease blood calcium levels, then you want it to be anywhere that's not blood. So in that case, you want it in bone. So the goal of calcitonin will be satisfied by increasing bone formation. This is why having a diet high in calcium makes someone's bones stronger. The more calcium you eat, the more calcium you'll have in your blood, and the more calcium you can put in the calcium bank, which is bone. If you want less in your blood, do you want it in your blood or in your feces? The answer is feces. So you're going to want to increase excretion in the feces. Excretion means get it out of your body, so increase excretion. And same thing with the urine. You want to get it out of your body, so you're going to increase excretion. Sorry the writing is so ugly. I cannot figure out how to change the color so the light blue isn't perfect to see, but it still gets the point across. If your stimulus is high blood calcium, you will increase calcitonin release. The goal of calcium is to decrease blood calcium levels. In order to do that, instead of putting the calcium in the blood, you'll have it somewhere else. And then somewhere else is either in the bone, in the feces, or in the urine. And all this happens because of these cells. So this follicle is making thyroid hormone. This follicle is making thyroid hormone. And in between these cells is the parafollicular cells making calcitonin. I've zoomed back out so we could take a look at our final histological structure, and that is the parathyroid gland. This is a close-up image of the parathyroid gland. I'm going to zoom in even more so we can see the cells, and that seems to be the maximum. What you see here is a dense collection of cells. Each one of these black dots is a cell. And near these, near these cells are going to be blood vessels. And because into those blood vessels is where parathyroid hormone is going to be released. Therefore, since it's released into the blood, the parathyroid gland is a endocrine gland. So what we're looking here is the parathyroid gland, a dense collection of cells. And they release parathyroid hormone, PTH. And like calcitonin, PTH has a relationship to blood calcium levels. But instead of, being re uh, instead of having the goal of reducing blood calcium levels, it will have the goal of increasing blood calcium levels. So parathyroid hormone does the opposite of calcitonin. Therefore, is the relationship between these hormones synergistic, antagonistic, or permissive?
If two hormones do the opposite thing, they function antagonistically. For a given stimulus, if two actions, if two hormones do the same thing, they function synergistically. Since these two are opposite, it is an antagonistic relationship. So, the stimulus for PTH release, instead of the high for calcitonin, the stimulus is low blood calcium. When this happens, PTH is released in increasing amounts. So the effect, what's the goal going to be? Will it be to increase or decrease blood calcium levels? The goal will be to increase blood calcium levels. Okay, so is this a good time to put calcium into bone? Or is this a good time to take calcium out of the bone? So what I'm asking is, if the bone is a bank for calcium uh, in the blood, is this a good time to put into the bank or take out of the bank? Ideally, you said the goal was to take calcium out of the bone and put it in the blood, because the blood is the most important thing. So our effectors here, just like before, are bone, kidney, and feces. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's, not, that's not the target organ. Bone, kidney, and the GI tract. Let's start with the GI tract. You just ate a, f a meal that's high in calcium. Is this a time that you want to absorb that calcium into your blood? Or is this a time where you want to excrete it in the feces? This is the time that you want to put the calcium in the blood, which means that you want to increase absorption. Notice it ends in absorption. You want to increase the absorption of the calcium rather than having it excreted in the feces, the opposite of what you saw with calcitonin. With the kidneys, is this a good time to have that calcium in the urine, or do you want to save it and bring it into the blood. You want to save it and bring it into the blood. So you want to increase what's called reabsorption of calcium. Notice the absorption again. You want to increase reabsorption of calcium. The reason you want to, it's called reabsorption, is because the first time it was absorbed was in the GI tract. And the second time it'll be absorbed in the blood is during reabsorption. So it's absorbed again, essentially. Finally, with bone, this is not a time where you want to form bone. This is a time you want to break down bone. And this is called re, let's write that again, resorption. And again, ends in sorption. So anytime you see the ending of absorption, it's essentially telling us it's going back into, either for the first time or back into the blood. And so if your goal is to take calcium and have it in the blood, you're going to want to zorp it from anything that you can. So you're going to resorp it from the bone, you're going to absorb it from the GI tract instead of putting it in the feces, and you're going to reabsorb it from the kidney instead of putting it in the urine. In conclusion, we have discussed... the follicle of the thyroid gland, somewhere in here, the parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland, and then what sits atop the thyroid gland, the parathyroid gland, of which you have four.